Well, good morning, and welcome once again to our Morning Walk with the Apostles. Today is Tuesday, the 13th of April. Very good to be with you this morning. Appreciate your taking the time to join us, and uh, if you're live, and if not, well, I appreciate you taking the time later in your day to spend a little time with us and looking into God's Word. Let's begin this morning with a word of prayer, and then we'll get right into uh, talking about the beginnings of the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. Let's bow. Loving Father, we're so grateful for your blessings in our lives and for your watching over and being with us and keeping us through the night, blessing us with this new day. And we pray, Father, that we might serve you this day as you would have us to, that we will take up, up advantage of opportunities that come our way to tell about Jesus, about your love and grace and mercy, and about your kingdom, the church. Father, thank you for the record in Acts of the spread of the gospel, of the efforts of those first century Christians to share the good news of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. We pray, Father, that as we review those in our morning walks, that uh, we will be in encouraged and uplifted with regard to our own efforts to spread the good news of the gospel of Jesus. I pray, Father, for those who are physically ill, whether it be from COVID or cancer or some other physical ailment, those that are having surgery and uh, those that have had surgery, and Father, I just pray your blessings upon all of them and their caregivers. Father, be with our country and our world. Help us to turn this world, specifically in the very place where we're located, to do what we can to turn this world back towards you. We thank you for the Christ and his sacrifice, and we pray in his name. Amen. Well, <clears throat> being part of a team has value for one who is going to preach the gospel in a new field. When Jesus sent out workers, he sent them in pairs, Mark 6, verse 7. As a rule, Paul did not attempt to work by himself. Now, I have known those who took their families into hard fields and tried to work alone. I admire their courage and dedication, but often the results were tragic. Workers became discouraged and quit. Marriage relationships were impaired or broken, and children were lost to the Lord. When Paul started on the first missionary journey with Barnabas and John Mark, he probably thought that he was part of a team that would be together indefinitely. However, that was not to be the case. It was not long until Mark left, Acts 13.13. 13. Then, as Paul contemplated uh, the second journey, he and Barnabas had, quote, a sharp disagreement, end quote, and went their separate ways, Acts 15.39. Paul had to rebuild the team. Now, if you are interested in sports, you know that every few years it is necessary to rebuild a team. In high school and college, players graduate. In the professional ranks, players go on to other teams or retire. You also know that it is hard to find quality players to replace those who leave. Paul's rebuilding effort was infinitely more important than rebuilding a sports team. He had to find the right ones or the Lord's work would suffer. He faced a monumental task. In this 
morning walk devotional. We begin our study of Paul's second missionary journey, a journey that took him to far-flung areas that he had never dreamed of evangelizing. In the early stages of this journey, we will see we will uh, also see that Paul gathered around him a new team of co-workers, most of whom would remain with him for the rest of his life. They became more than his team. They became his closest friends. When Paul and Barnabas parted company, Paul selected Silas to go with him on uh, the second journey. We met Silas earlier. He was a prophet, Acts 15.32, and one of the leading men in the Jerusalem congregation, Acts 15.22. He came to Antioch with Paul, Barnabas, and others to deliver the letter from the Jerusalem congregation that we read and studied about in Acts 15. While in Antioch, he did some preaching and teaching, encouraging and strengthening the brethren, Acts 15.32. Apparently, Paul was impressed with Silas' ability and saw him a kindred spirit. When Paul considered who might replace Barnabas, his thoughts turned to Silas. Now Silas was perfectly suited for Paul's purpose of visiting the churches established during the first journey. Like Paul, he could speak by inspiration. He could also share the workload. Like Paul, he was a Roman citizen, Acts 16.37, so he had the same political rights. He also had a qualification making him uniquely qualified and suited for the journey. He could confirm the genuineness of the letter from Jerusalem when it was delivered to the congregations, Acts 16.4 as he had in Antioch, Acts 15, verse 22 and 27. So, having added Silas to the team, Paul started on the second journey with someone to lighten his load. Acts 15, 40 says, But Paul chose Silas and departed, being committed by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. So once more, in some fashion, whether formal or informal, the Antioch brethren sent Paul on his way to the, with the blessings of the congregation and the blessings of the Lord. Barnabas had taken Mark and sailed to Cyprus, Acts 15.39. So Paul did not start by ship as he did on that first journey. Instead, he and Silas headed north and then west from Antioch, visiting congregations that Paul had probably established during his ten or so years of working in the vicinity of, of Tarsus. Verse 41 says, And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now let me switch over to uh, a map here, and uh, we'll look at that. This is a map of Paul's uh, and Silas' uh, second missionary journey. And uh, what we've talked about just now, if you'll look on the right-hand side of the map, about the middle, you see Antioch. And they've journeyed north and west toward uh, Tarsus in that area of Cilicia, where Paul had worked, for, as I said, for about 10 years or so earlier. Now, the, uh, the letter that they were bringing from Jerusalem was addressed to those congregations, if you remember from chapter 15, verse 23. 
If the epistle had not been previously sent to them, then Paul and Silas no doubt delivered it at this time. Now their task in Syria and Cilicia completed then, Paul and Silas headed west. Leaving the lowlands of Cilicia, they crossed the rugged Taurus Mountains through the pass known as the Cilician Gates, and at last came to the plateau of southern Galilee, where Paul had labored on the first journey. So let's go back to, uh, to the map here. And uh, that would be this next blue line coming from Tarsus across west to Derby. So Paul had, you recall, labored in uh, Lystra, Iconium, and Derby there on the far end of, of that first journey before they returned and started uh, retracing their steps. So, verse uh, 1, A of chapter 16 says that he came also to Derby and to Lystra. Now, since Paul came from the east this time and moving west instead of from the west moving east, Derby is mentioned before Lystra. When Paul reached Lystra, verse 1b of chapter 16 says, Behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, and his father was a Greek. So here we are introduced to the young man who became, quote, the dearest friend Paul ever knew, end quote. That's from J.W. McGarvey in his New Testament commentary of Acts of Apostles, volume 2, page 48. Ken R. Durham, in his article, Scenes in Philippi, in Acts, the Spreading Flame, page 187, spoke of Timothy as, quote, the son in the faith he never had in the flesh, end quote. Now we know from 2 Timothy 1 verse 5 that Timothy's mother, the Jewish woman who was a believer, was named Eunice, and that he also had a godly grandmother named Lois. From his childhood, these two godly women had taught Timothy the scriptures, 2 Timothy 3, verse 15, instilling in him a deep faith in God and his word, 2 Timothy 1, verse 5. When Paul came to Lystra for the first time on the first journey, not only were Eunice and Lois converted, but young Timothy, still a teenager, was also baptized. How blessed is a child whose parents and grandparents are concerned first and foremost about his spiritual welfare. If you are a parent with small children, understand that your greatest responsibility is to rear those children right, and your greatest service to the Lord is to teach them God's way. I do not know what else Eunice did in the service of God, but she never did a greater work than rearing a boy who could be used by the Lord. Now, it should also be noted that Eunice and Lois had to train up Timothy in the way he should go, Proverbs 22, 6, by themselves, with little or no help from others. Lystra had no synagogue, no rabbi to teach Timothy. Further, Eunice had married, evidently, a Gentile husband who did not share her faith and probably actively opposed the practice of her religion. You know, from time to time, I have returned to places where Linda and I have worked in the past or we've had contact with them in some way. And invariably, that 
contact fills me with both sadness and joy. I'm saddened when I learn that there are those who have fallen away from the faith. But I'm thrilled to see how others have grown spiritually. Paul must have been delighted to see the progress made by the young man, Timothy. Still in his late teens or possibly early 20s, he was already, quote, well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium, Acts 16.2. Now since Iconium was some distance from Lystra, Timothy had been active in the Lord's service over a wide area. Perhaps he already had a reputation as a preacher. Now at some point, the elders of the Lystra congregation laid their hands on him, setting him apart to do the work of an evangelist. 1 Timothy 4, 14. Perhaps that had occurred even before Paul arrived. You know, I am sure Timothy was still ragged around the edges, as all, <laughs> as all young preachers are. In addition to that, he was timid and apparently suffered from a variety of physical ailments, 1 Timothy 5.23. Nevertheless, Paul saw amazing potential in him and longed to have him as a part of his team. Paul desired to do with Timothy what Barnabas wanted to do with Mark train him for greater service in the kingdom. Perhaps Paul even envisioned Timothy as the man who could someday take his place. 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. So, Acts 16, verse 3 states, quote, Paul wanted this man to go with him, end quote. Timothy was still a young man. And his father was dead, we assume he's never mentioned. So Eunice had to make the decision herself whether or not to let Timothy travel with Paul. The fact that Eunice allowed him to go fills me with admiration for her. For a moment, put yourself in that mother's place. You can still hear the howling mob stoning and crushing the life from Paul. That happened in Derby. You can close your eyes and still see his broken body covered with blood. And now this man, Paul, who has often had to live like a hunted animal, comes to you and he says, I would like your son to come with me and share my life. What would you have said? I know what many mothers would have said. In my limited experience, the number one reason men and women have changed their minds about going to the mission field is a tearful mother who cried, please do not leave me. I cannot stand it if you go that far away. Or, Please do not deprive me of my grandchildren. What would those mothers do if a battered missionary came to them and said, I want your child to come and suffer with me? God bless parents who release their children 
to the work of the Lord, who say with Eunice, I would love to keep you here, son, with me. But God's work is more important than my personal desires. Yeah, as a parent, I have the right to worry about you. But I believe that God will watch over you. Go with my blessing. Well, we're going to stop there for today. And tomorrow we'll continue looking at the early stages of this second missionary journey and see the direction of the endeavor guided by the Holy Spirit as Paul receives a vision. I hope you can be with me then. For today, let's close our morning walk with a prayer, and then the, the day is yours. Let's bow. Loving Father, thank you for the example that we read about here in Acts 15 and 16 of Paul setting out and forming a new team of Silas and now Timothy on this second missionary journey for him. Thank you for the example of Timothy's mother, uh, Eunice, and uh, Timothy himself. And we pray, Father, that it can be an encouragement to us as we think about our own evangelizing, our own uh, dedicating of our children and grandchildren to your service. And just help us, Father, to know that that's the most important thing they can do, is serve in your kingdom, in whatever capacity that that might be. Be with us this day. Help us to serve and evangelize and do what we can in your kingdom. We thank you again for the Christ, and we pray in his name. Amen. Well, I hope you make your Tuesday a wonderful day. Spring is here. It's getting warmer and more pleasant every day. And it's just so good to be alive now and have the opportunities of service that we have in the kingdom of God. I'll see you tomorrow.